Well, so welcome everybody uh, to the webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Sally McIntyre. I'm the general manager here at uh, Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority. And with me this evening is Allison Simon, who's the project manager who oversaw the development of this watershed plan. Allison, if you want to wave. <laughs> <laughs> as well as Shanna Gatoski, who's our community relations coordinator, who's been working uh, hand in glove with Allison throughout this to uh, engage with the public and is coordinating this evening's event for us. So uh, um, between us, we're sort of like the core team who've been working on this watershed plan now for the better part of 18 months. And so thank you very much for joining us this evening to, uh, to review where we got to, how we got to where we are and where we are and where we want to go. So I'm just gonna continue on here. So um, I'm just gonna minimize something on my screen here. I don't know whether you guys are just seeing my, um, my PowerPoint or if uh, you're also seeing other things on my screen. Can somebody just tell me whether you're just seeing the PowerPoint or are you also seeing other things? I'm just, yeah, just seeing the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, this is uh, the jurisdiction of uh, this watershed plan. It's just the Mississippi River. We also have jurisdiction over areas to the west and north of here in the city of Ottawa in the carp watershed, as well as areas draining right into the Ottawa River. But this plan is just pertains to the Mississippi uh, River watershed. And you can ex see it extends uh, all the way from Addington Highlands up past Bon Echo Park, th down through the watershed to where it discharges near Galetta into the Ottawa River. Um, so there are uh, four th key things that this watershed plan achieves. First of all, it helps everybody in the watershed to have a broad understanding of the watershed itself. You know, key facts and figures, how, how it's evolved over time and what is, what's on the ground today. Um, it also documents the shared goals and objectives that we as uh, residents, business owners, uh, people who rec recreate in the watershed, uh, what our vision is for this watershed and where collectively we want to see how we want to see it managed going forward. And to that end, then it it's, uh, outlines um, 33 actions on how we could get there. You know, what are the things we need to do today or over the next period of time to achieve those goals and objectives? And lastly, it helps to um, make the public aware of the role that they can play in resource management and helping to achieve those objectives. So uh, we took a number of steps to get here. It, it did start back in 2019 um, with the production of four really terrific background documents that really helped to encapsulate um, everything we at MVCA knew about the watershed. Uh, and those were circulated to federal, provincial, municipal uh, partners, as well as others in the community to validate, you know, whether the facts and figures as we understood them were correct and complete. As well that fall, I wanted to point out that we established a public advisory committee. So we you know, publicized the fact that we are undertaking this, this project and we did outreach into the community and people applied to sit on that committee. And it's been a terrific group to work with over the past 18 months. They've acted as a sounding board, as editors, as fact checkers. Um, they've just been a tremendous group of people to work with throughout this process. So um, the next set of uh, deliverables, I'll call it on the project, were uh, the goals and objectives that did go before the public advisory committee, our own policy and uh, priorities committee, which is a standing committee of MBCA's board. And that board is made up of municipal councillors and appointees. Um, and that was signed off by our board last fall. And then, um, we produced over last winter a series of dis discussion papers, and these did sort of a deep dive on specific topics we knew would be of interest to people. Because uh, while the watershed plan covers the whole gamut, most people come to projects like this with specific issues uh, or concerns in mind. So that's what those discussion papers did was they, they encapsulated um, everything we knew about that particular topic, both state of the nation, as it were, the issues that we're having to grapple with, as well as some of the actions that could potentially be undertaken. 
And it was through review of those discussion papers over the winter months that helped to get us to where we are today with uh, the draft watershed plan. Part of the uh, engagement we did in the early part of this year was to host uh, various webinars and forums on some of those topics uh, to engage people and get that feedback. We wanted to make sure that this watershed plan accurately reflected um, our shared understanding of where we need to be going on the in the watershed and how to get there. So uh, in a nutshell, there are uh, eight key themes that emanated through this whole process, and you can see them there. And within that, then there are a, a further 33 actions uh, that were identified. So some of the priority areas that came through this whole consultation process was the need for collaboration. MVCA is an organization, it's just one player at the table. Uh, water is a shared resource. Uh, it goes through um, 11 jurisdictions here in the Mississippi watershed. There are 11 municipalities that the water flows through. It's regulated at the federal and provincial level, but land development and, and water taking is often um, managed or primarily managed at the municipal level. Um, so it's, it's important that all of us collaborate to make sure we're managing the resource well. And at the end of the day, we as individuals and businesses and, and uh, where we work and play, we, we need to be cognizant about uh, how we're managing the land from a, a water management perspective and then the resource itself. So on that, uh, robust water management infrastructure, in our case, uh, dam structures, but in municipal cases, it's stormwater collection systems, water and wastewater purification plants, um, you know, the whole municipal drain system, all of that infrastructure needs to be designed in a manner that um, uses the resource smart in a smart manner and also with a view to the future, both in terms of not just growth and what the future demands are going to be, but within the context of climate change. And to, the word we use there is resilience. So we want that infrastructure to be resilient uh, to the impacts of climate change. And so that means that everything we need to be doing uh, needs to have a view to you know, sustainable infrastructure management going forward, sustainable water management going forward. So uh, there are, as I mentioned, 33 actions. They're grouped in the watershed plan by theme or goal. Uh, we identify partners who we need to be working with because as I just mentioned, it's not just an MVCA uh, responsibility. Everybody um, at all levels of government and at the private level and at the corporate level have responsibilities. And then to also identify some of those implementation considerations, because just because the action shows up in the plan doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy and straightforward to implement. So um, I'm going to walk through uh, the eight themes and, and um, just highlight some of the actions. But before I go there, are there any questions that people have about how we got to this point in the process. I'm happy to stop here and answer any questions people might have about the process followed to this point. And you can either raise your hand using the participant tool, or if you want to just go on video and wave your hand, you can do that too. Okay, so I don't see any questions. So I'm just going to keep moving on then. So the first theme is integrated management and collaboration, as I've just mentioned, and you can see there the actual goal as it's written in the plan. So some of the actions identified, uh, including extending the role of our public advisory committee, which I told you were a fantastic resource to us throughout this project. Um, and incidentally, uh, some um, draft regulations that are currently under development by the province, and there's a consultation pro, uh, document out there uh, for people to comment on, um, recommends that all conservation authorities have some form of public advisory committee. So uh, we're probably just gonna take this existing public advisory committee and adjust the terms of reference to make sure that it meets whatever those final um, uh, terms of reference are for or requirements are of the regulation 
because we've been very happy with uh, how that um, group has worked uh, so collaboratively and helpfully throughout this project. Um, to uh, undertake meaningful and ongoing engagement with Indigenous partners. And, and I think it's fair to say that um, uh, the, the role of uh, First Nations, particularly in our watershed uh, and in Indigenous communities across Canada uh, and, um, uh, you know, quite frankly, historical injustices and the need for all of us and every organization to acknowledge that and to address it is, is very much a part of where we need to be going with this watershed plan. Um, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do the degree of uh, consultation and engagement with our First Nations as we would have liked to, but there's uh, totally a commitment on behalf of MVCA to do that going forward. Um, Similarly, we want to continue to collaborate with our lake communities. We have really good relationships with many of the lake associations, and that's going to be important going forward. So climate change is a major issue throughout the document um, and uh, one that I think we all need to be cognizant of. Uh, and so some of the considerations that the plan identifies is the impact of climate change on potential increases in flooding, drought, erosion, uh, impacting water quality, um, decreased soil moisture, which of course has huge implications for uh, the agricultural sector. Um, and you can see other considerations there as well. So these are all things that we need to be thinking about in terms of climate change. So some of the actions that the plan identifies are the need for us to better understand this. And one of the things I was just at Carleton Place uh, Council the other night, and one of the things we were talking about there was uh, the need for us to enhance the model that we have of the watershed to be able to allow us to uh, do scenario analysis to see what different events might, how they might un unfold on the landscape. And, and so we can predict where problem areas are but also to identify potential areas of opportunity where we might want to create more reservoir capacity in the watershed. Right now, we actually have very limited reservoir capacity. Our main reservoir is Crotch Lake. Uh, and this spring, because of the early spring and the hot, uh, dry um, spring that we've had, it's already below level. Uh, where we like to have it for this time of year. So it's really important for us to have those tools and that understanding to be able to predict the impacts of climate change and therefore plan on how we're going to adapt to and ensure resilient communities. So, um, so a lot of this, uh, the plan addresses the impacts of, uh, of climate change and our understanding of it uh, in any number of ways. The next theme is growth and development, and, and uh, so to support environmentally sustainable growth and economic development. So what does that look like? Well, it means that we need to work collaboratively with our municipal and development community to make sure that every new house, all new infill, uh, is built as smart as possible, um, both to mitigate the demand for water, to ensure that it's not um, uh, causing a reduction in the ecological services provided by natural systems. And that when I say that, I mean, for instance, if we take down forests, uh, that's not only reducing our ability for carbon capture, but from a water management perspective, it's also um, increasing the rate of flow off the, the, the watershed. So water will hit the water shed uh, the, the main stem of the river that much faster. That exacerbates the risk of erosion and flooding. It also um, results in uh, warmer water because as water you know, goes through tributaries and, and goes through runoff through forests, it, it's kept cool. But if it's just hitting pavement, it's, it's heated up and that means the general temperature in the watershed is going to increase that has impacts on the potential growth of algae blooms, um, the degradation of fish habitat, etc. So um, water management is of course a, a main theme and when I say water management I'm meaning how we manage uh, both demand but also 
actual flows. So it's water taking and water management on the landscape. So some of the components from our perspective of, of course, uh, the dam structure, such as you see there. And not everybody knows, but we have this document called the Mississippi River Water Management Plan. And it's different from a watershed plan, which looks at the whole host of issues within the broader watershed. A water management plan is uh, the document that we and the hydro operators on the watershed are responsible for adhering to. It actually prescribes target levels that we're to, supposed to um, operate and strive for in terms of different levels and flows throughout the watershed at different times of year. And so we're always trying to operate our facilities to meet within those uh, boundaries set out by that plan. And that plan is approved by the province of Ontario. So uh, in addition to the structures are the reservoirs that I've spoken to. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, the whole municipal side that we need to be um, making sure that any new infrastructure is planned in a manner that um, meets future demand and is mitigating impacts. And so one of the things, as I mentioned, I was at Carleton Place, they're undertaking a, a water wastewater master plan. So those are the sorts of tools that municipalities have at their disposal that they can use to um, review future demands, both under current conditions and future state, and make sure that um, the infrastructure they're building is gonna be resilient. Uh, I think I've covered a lot of these points, so I'll just keep going. Uh, although actually, I, the last bullet there, uh, work with watershed landowners, communities and industry to balance competing demands for water use in a sustainable manner. So um, when you think about where we're at right now, we're roughly 65% normal levels uh, on the main stem of the river today. Um, and if this pro is prolonged, it, it could create uh, severe drought conditions, um, not just in the superficial uh, system, but also in the groundwater system. And so we've already declared a level one uh, low water uh, condition. And, and to the degree that all of us have these conversations about where the priority needs are and how we're going to manage scarcity, the better able will be to respond, plan for and respond to those events when they occur. So just like this pandemic, to the degree that we had supplies in stock, we knew how we were gonna manage the situation. Um, droughts, uh, when they occur, to the degree that you're prepared for them, you'll be better able to adapt to them. So some of the actions that uh, the plan identifies is to uh, better understand what the water budget is. Some initial analysis was done in that respect several years back in association with the source water uh, protection plan um, that was done for Carleton Place and, and the uh, groundwater systems uh, around Almont. Uh, but they don't deal with the, the watershed in its entirety. They're just municipal system focused. So we need to take a much broader and harder look across the watershed uh, and not just at municipal systems, but all those private systems. And there's a, a bit of a movement happening, particularly in southwestern Ontario, uh, particularly in areas with groundwater systems, where they're wanting to expand the scope of the whole source water protection program of the province to address this very issue. So we also want to update our, our water management plan, as I described to you, because that water management plan was developed using historic data. But as we know, um, historic trends are no longer going to be carrying forward, that everything's going to be much more variable and potentially extreme. So we need to really take a hard look at that plan and see how we will need to operate the system under those extreme conditions going forward. Um, I, I think I've mentioned about, you know, the need for uh, smart development. So some of what smart development addresses is things like on-site retention and infiltration of water. Let's keep the water at source rather than releasing it, you know, and at, uh, allowing it to shed off the land where it'll just go into the system and disappear and we won't have use of it down the road. So we need to keep that water in the watershed to the degree 
uh, you know, to appropriate levels. So the next uh, theme in the watershed plan is natural hazards uh, to mitigate those, uh, minimize and mitigate those risks. So some of the things we need to consider are our floodplain mapping. So a piece of good news is that uh, MVCA and its partners, Rideau Valley Conservation Authority and South Nation uh, Co Conservation applied to the federal government earlier this year under the National Disaster Mitigation Program. And we just recently learned that we got funding to conduct a flood risk um, assessment. And what that assessment's going to do is it's going to look across our watershed and identify which areas we need to focus on next for doing floodplain mapping. This watershed is over 3,500 square kilometers and it comprised of not just the main stem uh, and, you know, of the river and major tributaries, but also any number of sub watersheds. And so this uh, study will allow us to identify which areas of the watershed are at greater, greatest risk of flooding and help us prioritize future floodplain mapping work. Uh, so related to that, then it'll help us to engage with our municipalities in conversations about how we're mitigating those risks and one of the tools in the municipal quiver is you know the whole land use planning regime and uh, how the land use planning act uh, the planning act of Ontario is administered. Um, so there are also you know physical things that can be done on the landscape both uh, to mitigate you know, the impacts on existing development and to prevent those impacts from occurring or eliminating those risks for future development. So some of the uh, actions that it, it identifies is to uh, obviously ensure that our, our floodplain mapping is complete and up to date, as well as our erosion risk mapping, um, to um, uh, undertake a roadway flood vulnerability assessment strategy. This is an important one because so much of the land development, I think it's uh, Allison will correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's either 8,000 dwellings or 8,000 people live, you know, on a shoreline somewhere. Um, and, and many of those households and, and people access that house via a private road or a public road that may flood. Um, and so we need to be working with our municipalities to identify those roads um, and work with those municipalities and those road associations to figure out how we're going to address those issues going forward. Because there's two issues here. One, um, obviously it, it, it presents a significant hazard to the people living on those roads if they can't get in and out during flood events. And secondly, our legislation actually mandates that we need to be restricting further development on those roads if there is not safe passage during flood conditions. So this is an area where we think we really need to be working closely both with landowners, road associations, and municipalities to tackle uh, how we're gonna address this. Um, so the next theme is water quality. Uh, water quality is a huge issue for everybody. Um, most people in the watershed take their water, have private systems, uh, and they're either taking it directly from the river or tributary or from groundwater. So, um, there's any number of sources of pollution uh, in the watershed, and many of these will be exacerbated with the impacts of climate change. So you can see some of the key ones there. Um, one of the reasons why uh, climate change can intensify these impacts is if you think about the conditions we have on the watershed today, uh, the same amount of pollutant going into a lesser amount of water, and if that water is also superheated, um, it, it just uh, creates the conditions for all sorts of things to occur that will degrade the quality of that water. So some of the other considerations is we need to be able to see what's happening on the landscape and monitor and track uh, what we're seeing so that we can make people aware and cognizant of, of what's happening and, uh, and be able to perhaps implement certain regulations to protect the quality that's there today. Um, and not just through regulation, but obviously as well through public education and stewardship programs. So on that last point, I just wanted to say that we, um, we, are, uh, we have approval from our board and recently hired a new stewardship person 
to run a, a three-year stewardship project. And so we're looking forward to working with the residents in the watershed on how they can um, you know, do things on their property to, to mitigate their, their impacts on the landscape. So uh, I've already mentioned the source protection program. Um, working with municipalities uh, in assessing and enhancing stormwater management, uh, as you can appreciate, so much of um, you know, the, the watershed was developed in the absence of stormwater, formal stormwater management. Aside from roadside ditches, most houses and even many, most subdivisions have no formal stormwater uh, management from a, a pollution management control. Uh, they were developed prior to such being common. Um, or there's a, a basic assumption that the size of the lots involved are gonna mitigate uh, the impacts. But the, the reality is so much forest cover and wetland is being uh, consumed through that development that I don't think we can make those same assumptions as maybe historically were made. Um, a key thing that everybody can be doing uh, who has a septic system is to make sure it's functioning properly. Um, there are areas in the watershed where uh, subsurficial um, non-point source contamination is what we call it, is when this pollution, you can't point to it and say it's coming from that, you know, sewage treatment plant, but it's insidious. It's happening everywhere along all these waterfront properties where the septic systems aren't functioning properly. So, it, you know, that's something everybody can do to make sure that they're part of the solution, as it were. So uh, the seventh theme is natural systems. Um, we wanna maintain and enhance what we have, uh, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. And so one of the key things that uh, the plan recommends is that we uh, look at public acquisition of conservation lands uh, or working through stewardship agreements um, or conservation agreements with with landowners and helping them to be the active stewards of that land. Interestingly, I mentioned earlier in the presentation about these draft regulations that the province uh, has a consultation document out on. And, and here there also was good alignment between what we were thinking needs to happen in our watershed and where the province is at. They call it, we call it, um, uh, well, I'm not on that page yet, but uh, a land conservation plan, but they've called it a land acquisition and disposition plan. Effectively, it's the same thing. It's a, a plan that identifies those key areas in the watershed that we think are providing either ecological services, i.e. they are, you know, um, pro providing for infiltration, uh, storage of water, cooling, carbon capture storage, you know, corridors for uh, uh, and habitat for uh, natural species, etc., and uh, at different stages of their life cycle. Um, and uh, and so, you know, if we want to protect those areas, we that's not an easy thing to happen. We're very lucky that a huge part of the upper watershed is in crown land, but as you move downstream. Um, it's private, mainly in private ownership, and so we need to figure out, okay, how, how are we going to retain those natural values and those ecological services for everyone? Um, and is it fair to ask landowner A to, you know, basically sterilize their land for development, or do we need to work collectively to ensure that those resources are protected for all? So some of the actions, uh, I've mentioned this land conservation strategy. Uh, and so, I, and I've mentioned ecological services, but a lot of people don't have a good handle on what that is or the financial value of those. So when you destroy a wetland, you drain it for whatever purpose, um, you're removing that capacity or that storage capacity or whatever that ecological service is from the landscape. And if you were to try to rebuild it and, you know, re replenish that ecological service on the landscape, what would it actually cost if you were to try to build it using, you know, bulldozers, etc. cetera. Um, and that helps us to better appreciate perhaps um, what we're sacrificing when we remove these natural systems on, from the landscape. So 
um, this is a, an area of work that we think we need to do some, uh, uh, make some effort uh, to be able to quantify and communicate the value of these ecological services to landowners, to municipalities, to developers, to everybody. So uh, the eighth and last uh, theme is education and stewardship. Uh, and, and this you know, comes right back to collaboration that everybody has a role in, in watershed management. So uh, one of the challenges is uh, sustained funding and commitment to a stewardship program. Um, obviously education is something that you're constantly having to do. And particularly as we see more and more people move from the urban areas to rural areas, there's those potentials for um, not just land use conflicts, but just simple um, lack of awareness and understanding of uh, how the landscape works and their role in protecting it and managing it properly. Um, and then also, uh, you know, providing the financial resources, as I mentioned earlier, to landowners to be the stewards of the land that collectively we need them to be. Uh, to help us manage those resources for all. So uh, right now within MBCA's jurisdiction, most of the monies we receive are, are focused from and in the city of Ottawa. So we wanna expand that stewardship program and education to obviously beyond the city of Ottawa. We have 11 municipalities and that would just be one. Um, so that's why we got approval for that three year uh, stewardship pilot. And uh, we've also um, been talking recently, although uh, nothing's official yet, but with the County of Lanark uh, and other partners in the county um, about uh, teaming up with ALICE, which is the Alternative Land Use Services is what it was originally called, but it's a program targeting the agricultural sector and working with them, providing them with the financial resources to help them make uh, improvements on their properties. Um, to make them more sustainable operations. Um, so um, that's that in terms of the actions. I, I think I've pretty much covered it, uh, except I, I'm just reiterating here the need for us to continue to work with our Indigenous communities and make sure that they are working hand in glove with us throughout this uh, watershed planning process because they haven't been able to be engaged throughout the uh, pandemic to the degree any of us wanted, we are anticipating having to um, produce another discussion paper at a future uh, point in time once we've been able to have those fulsome discussions and perhaps to make uh, amendments to the plan. So this is where you can find our plan on the internet. And we're inviting everybody to provide comments by June 25th. Um, our goal is to uh, present a final version of the plan to our board on July 16th or 17th, I think it is. In any event, it's our July meeting of our board. So if you want to provide us with written comments, please do so. Um, and at this point, I am happy to uh, answer any questions people have. So, uh, if you have a question, just uh, feel free to either unmute yourself and ask the question or to go into the participant tool and raise a, a yellow hand, or you can just uh, do like I am right now and just wave at me if you have a question. Sally, it's Noelle. Hi, Noelle. Um, so I'm going to be taking a report to council on the 22nd, um, you know, in support of the plan, because I think that it sounds terrific. It's really um, wide ranging in scope. And there's particular things that I'm sure council will be very appreciative of, like the study about how roads may be impacted by floods in the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's um, any area that maybe you've gotten pushback on that you hope, uh, you know, councils would support, um, you know, because basically I'm thinking, I, I just want to recommend to council that, you know, they're pleased with the draft report. Um, 
but I'm just wondering if there's anything else we could say that would be, you know, particularly helpful that, that you're encountering, you know, sort of lack of support on. Um, honestly, Noelle, at this point, uh, we're not hearing any lack of support. Our main concern at this point is more having to do with the structural change that's happening uh, at conservation authorities in Ontario and our whole funding model. So for example, the work that we are recommending to be done, um, we're not 100% sure it's gonna be fundable going forward. And so, you know, I, this is where, you know, the theme of collaboration is so important that um, uh, people look to us to do this work, but obviously like any organization, we need to be resourced to do it. And, uh, and so I think that's sort of our, our key theme um, is that as long as municipalities can continue to support the research and analysis work of the authority, I think we're good. And of course, yeah. I mentioned, I, I, of course, I mentioned the stewardship side of, as well. You know, we want to be able to deliver stewardship programming across the watershed. And right now, that's it's kind of constrained. Yeah, I I'm just kind of you know, waiting for the dust to settle on this whole funding um, issue, because even just in my day to day work, um, it's not clear to me that something like, um, you know, Diane Reed giving her planning comments on a rezoning application, if that's actually going to be funded by the province, or if that's something that the township needs to budget, and we all start doing budget, like first thing in September, even a little bit like end of August. So I'm not sure if those answers will even be there, but if we don't put money in the budget for 2022, you know, that would be bad. So do well, you have a, a sense? Uh, yeah, so two things. Thankfully, they appear to be pushing out the deadline from 2022 to 2023. So oh, good. So that's that was great. <laughs> Number two, um, planning reviews uh, at least in the county of Lanark, where you are, are, are managed through the county, and we already collect fees for that, uh, and have an MOU with the county, which I believe, you know, is partnered with all the area municipalities on. Matt uh, from our office would have the better handle on the mechanics of that. In any event, um, it was always outside of the funding we received from the province and via the municipal levy. Um, what we might need to be looking at, though, is uh, to the extent that there may be cross subsidizing happening. Uh, so one of the things that all the CAs are going to have to do is probably a review of all its fees, because to the extent that our funding is depleted, we're going to have to go back and look at all our planning fees and see, OK, is this a cost recovery service or do we need to adjust our fees? But that's very much different from this watershed plan, of course. Okay, well, that's that's all good to hear. Um, and I guess my last comment is really just a, a question. Um, I, I know because COVID constrained the Indigenous outreach, and um, it's kind of a selfish question because I'm just about to start my official plan. Right. And uh, I just wondered if you were able to get in touch with representatives from the Ardok Algonquin and the Shabbat Abajawan or was it more centralized through the Algonquins of Ontario office and uh, the Métis office? So I'll start the answer and I'll let Alison pick up where I leave off. So we retained a consultant to work with us on this and they reached out to actually, I think over 30 different First Nation communities and uh, basically asking them, you know, telling them we're doing this project, do you want to be engaged? And so we heard back from four. I couldn't tell you exactly which four, but maybe Allison can. Um, and, and so that's where we're heading is to, to continue to engage with the communities that we're interested. And in. uh, um, but Allison, can I turn it to you? Yeah. So um, within that 30 communities that the uh, in, our consultant reached out to, that included the Ardoc and Shabbat groups. And it's my understanding that both of those deferred to the Algonquins of Ontario to represent them um, and speak on their behalf. 
but we actually are, are revisiting some of that contact, just double checking with a lot of those communities, just because it's been so long since we initially reached out to them, um, just to give them kind of a second uh, crack at, at being engaged and, and involved in the project. So we'll be communicating with, through our consultants, with both of those communities again, just to see if they want more of a direct engagement. But their initial response was to allow AFO to um, speak on their behalf. Yeah, that, that's what I'm hearing too. Okay. Um, yeah, I won't take up any more of your time on that. There, there is a new group called the Tay River Algonquians who um, are kind of located in the middle of Tay Valley and they've just surfaced. They are um, status Algonquin. Um, and they're going to take on some of that outreach to the local Algonquin on uh, my behalf uh, for the Tay Valley uh, official plan. Um, and, and what they've made you know, pretty clear is that if you want engagement, you, you know, may have to, in a sense, pay for it, not, not to sort of you know, entice people to come and engage, but to respect that it's taking up their time. Mm -hmm. And if they are going to share, you know, information about natural heritage features or something from their perspective, you know, maybe they don't have a biology degree, but they are well respected in the community and that 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 should be respected, you know, perhaps with being paid for their time. So that's, yeah. that's something I have to, you know, process in terms of budgeting. So I just yeah. thought I would share that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and Noelle, on that, I mean, we acknowledge that right from the get-go um, because you have these small groups of people who are being asked on any number of projects to provide, oh, can you give us your expertise, right? Well, you know, you, on a cumulative basis, that's a lot of time, and a, a lot of these organizations don't have those kind of resources. So we've um, actually explored potentially getting grants to help them, you know, free up capacity or, or acquire uh, support to enable them to participate effectively. And that's that's pretty much standard now, as I understand it. Anyway, thank you very much for that, Noel. Are there other questions? Lauren, I saw you uh, unmuted uh, and showed yourself a bit earlier. I, I got caught. Yes, I got caught. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, you always wonder, and with all the, uh, the tension that's coming with the bill with respect to the conservation area, but this strategy presents a very large uh, new driver for your organization. How, how does this fit in? I mean, you, you have a strategic plan for the organization. Now you have a strategy for the watershed. This is going to suck resources or it's going to have to align with resources mm -hmm. that are there. How, how do you how do you fit a strategy on top of a strategy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so um, as you mentioned, we have the corporate strategic plan. Then we have this watershed plan. We also have the Carp River watershed plan for that other area of our watershed. Um, then the province also wants us to develop what they're calling this land acquisition and disposal strategy, which is very close to what we created in this plan called the water, uh, the land conservation plan. Um, and then for all of our conservation areas, they want us to develop master plans. Now we already have master plans for all of our conservation areas, except the, late, the, the one we just acquired last year, uh, which is the uh, Carp River uh, Conservation Area in the city of Ottawa. So as it relates to the various master plans, uh, we are gonna have to take a serious look at those from the, con at the conservation areas because that's where the funding model is changing very significantly. Um, and uh, from what we can tell, the province isn't going to move on that. So in a nutshell, if a conservation area is being used purely for natural heritage protection, and it has no recreational kind of use, then all those costs are covered. So, you know, potentially fencing, inspection, pest control, all that sort of stuff. But as soon as you put a driveway and a parking lot and maybe a pathway through it, uh, outhouses or flush washrooms, a gazebo, whatever the case may be, none of those costs are covered going forward. 
and uh, and then any of the programs that you might run at those conservation areas, like the education program and the like, none of those are going to be covered. So while programs and services, one is used to kind of the vagaries of board decisions and councils, whether you expand or contract programs and services, the harder piece are those capital assets. Um, because they come with long-term sustained requirements to uh, investment, both to maintain and to replace them over time. Uh, so, and we have a comprehensive tree management, a hazard tree program for the purpose of protecting those people who walk through uh, on our trails. So under the new funding model, none of those costs would necessarily be covered by the municipal levy. It would be up to uh, individual municipal councils to determine whether or not they wanted to continue to support the conservation area in delivery of those uh, services and in the renewal of those assets. So if you think about our pathways, you know, we're always looking at them every year for slip trip fall hazards and maybe building them up with, um, you know, um, mulch, et cetera. We always have to add gravel, right, to parking lots and grade them. You know, there's these fundamental costs that every conservation area that has any sort of recreational component to it have to incur. So the question is, how are we going to fund that going forward if not through the municipal levy? Are we going to have to increase fees? You know, there's only so high you can put fees and before it becomes a, a, a real barrier to entry. And, and do we want these public lands to be exclusive for the rich, <laughs> you know? Uh, and could you even hope to recover all the costs through a fee structure? Because at some point nobody's gonna attend because the fees are just unreasonable. So these are sort of the very practical questions that you know we're putting back to the province and saying, it's one thing to say the programs and services aren't going to be supported. It's another thing to say that none of the capital infrastructure is gonna be supported through the municipal levy. That was a very long-winded answer, hey. and I don't even partially answered your question there. Well, uh, well rehearsed. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions that people might have? And don't be shy. <laughs> it's a very small group here, so... Well, if there's no more questions, um, you can always reach out to Allison. Um, I hope you jotted down her, her information. I'll just share it again here. Uh, and just to make sure that uh, everybody has it here. So if you want to, um, uh, it's not coming down. There we go. Um, if you want to contact Allison or submit uh, uh, questions or comments, uh, there's her contact information and uh, absolutely we encourage everybody to reach out if you have questions and to provide us your comments and and please uh, if you have friends family neighbors who might be interested in this uh, please forward this information to them you know um, and encourage people to uh, to comment because uh, we're in this together it is a shared resource and we want to manage it collectively so that's all from me this evening so if there's no more questions, um i will close it out there so everybody have a lovely evening take care thanks very much you thanks too bye-bye